Hello everyone, my name is Dobson Boudreau and today I'm here joined by Peter Johnston. Uh, he's here to share some of his world views, shed some knowledge and give some informational sessions in his new upcoming show, Outside the Box. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Peter Johnston as you've already heard and I'm a minimalist. I moved to Cape Breton just under a year ago and I retired two years ago and I was trying to retire in British Columbia but it was just too expensive. Uh, being a minimalist, I've always kept uh, my income on the lower side rather than the higher side because uh, I don't want more than I need until everybody has enough. That's the principles behind being a minimalist. And our society at the moment really needs to embrace this idea and I'm happy to say that it is a growing trend. Minimalism is a growing trend. Up until a couple of years ago, you'd hardly heard the word, now you hear it quite a lot. So what exactly is minimalism? Well, our society, our economy, has been going full blast now for uh, ooh, a couple of hundred years, more than that in fact, when the stock exchange started and, and industry started going big time and we had the Industrial Revolution, and ever since then, the people's standard of living has been rising, uh, not equally, unfortunately, but generally speaking, there are more people in the world that are better off than ever before, and that's because of our economic system. But unfortunately, our economic system is based on continual growth. I can recall when I was 14, in the uh, mid-60s, it must have been 64 or something like that, uh, I was at a general studies class in school and the teachers and we were studying the uh, the British economy and the teacher said uh, the British economy needs to rise by two and a half percent a year it has to grow by two and a half percent a year and I stuck my hand up because even then I was uh, inclined to ask interesting questions and uh, I stuck my hand up and I said well how long is that going to go on for sir and he said, oh, it has to go on all the time. We have to, our economy has to grow by 2.5% every year, at least more, preferably more. And I remember, I remember walking out of that class and thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. How on earth can anything continually grow when we're living on a planet? That is, you know, I was 14 or so at the time, and I, I, I could see what the problems were, and, and, and here we are. We've got the mass consumption has been going on for so long. Everybody is tuned into it. We've got to get more, more. We've got to get newer things. Uh, and, and it's just, uh, it's unsustainable. It's, it's ridiculous. And it's time people smartened up. Now, I'm not blaming individuals. Uh, all the individuals, all, every, everybody involved in this system is, I don't blame the individuals. The problem is the system. It was uh, designed for different times than the times we're entering now. We're now entering the period when the world is seriously running out of resources and space, space to continue to grow. We're destroying the planet because we're destroying the biosphere by clearing more and more land for agriculture, and for cities. Our cities are becoming huge, our population is enormous, and it just can't go on. And so what people, people are asking, they're saying, well, they feel overwhelmed. They say, you know, well, what can I do as an individual to help uh, rectify this system? And the answer is, become a minimalist. Uh, and now, a minimalist is somebody who gets by on as little as possible. It was still leading a comfortable life. I mean, I live a wonderful life. Um, I actually <laughs> spent some months down in Mexico this winter. Um, my only income is CPPOAS and uh, income support or something, you know, for uh, people like me who don't have much money. and. Uh, it's because I'm a minimalist that uh, 1300 bucks or so a month I get is more than enough. It's, uh, in fact, <laughs> I, I'm able to save money. It's quite extraordinary. And it's just because um, my lifestyle is 
somewhat uh, primitive compared to, s to some people's, but uh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, I've managed to buy a piece of land um, locally, uh, just off Ile Madame, and uh, I could buy it outright because it's in Cape Breton and not in BC. Uh, in BC, for the for the money I paid for uh, the 14 acres of land uh, in Cape Breton, I would have been lucky to get a parking spot in British Columbia. And in British Columbia and Alberta, where I worked also, everybody's chasing the big buck. Uh, they've totally swallowed the uh, hook, line, and sinker, the idea that they're going to get rich one day. And that's what they're working to towards. And I like the fact that uh, over here in the Maritimes, not everybody's chasing the big buck. Um, they're more likely to be chasing good times. And uh, that's, that's the way it should be. But uh, I'm not saying uh, it wouldn't be better if there was a little more money around so, so that uh, there weren't so many people finding it hard to make ends meet. But the truth is there's plenty of money. The truth is that some people have got too much and other people don't have enough. It's inequality that is the problem. And uh, that need, we need to do something about it. But uh, in the meantime, how can an individual help the planet? Because we're, we're, uh, we're hearing all the time about uh, the disasters and the effects of climate change and how it's uh, destroying the, uh, the forests. Uh, it's, uh, the, the rainforests are becoming um, dry. The oceans are becoming heated in areas where they were cooler before, and everything's changing. But the fact is, uh, climate change has been going on all the time. Climate changes all the time. But we are exacerbating the situation by um, just uncontrolled burning and manufacturing uh, of products and g generating a, a mess and converting our natural capital, which is nature, converting it to cash and garbage. And what can we do? Well, we, we can become minimalist, and I'm a minimalist. And so uh, how do I do this? Well, I'm off the grid. Um, I bought a, a solar cell and a control box, etc. It cost me less than 500 bucks to go off the, off the grid. Um, the reason it cost me less than 500 bucks is because I do without, I don't have a washing machine or a dryer. Um, I will get a washing machine, but it probably will be, <laughs> probably will be manually powered rather than electrically powered. And uh, this all goes along with, with my minimalist um, attitude and way of living. And it's wonderful, like my diet. I, it, if you're a minimalist, you're not going to be eating expensive cuts of, uh, of steak or that kind of thing. You're going to be eating food that is really nutritious, really good for you and really cheap. Now, if that all sounds like a tall order, um, I will tell you that my diet, I, I treat my diet, I treat my food as medicine, which is the most wholesome way of looking at our food. Um, that means if you, if, if you treat your food as medicine, if you are eating something that you think is bad medicine, uh, that you know won't do you any good, then you don't eat it. And in fact, minimalism is mainly a, a program where you don't do things rather than you are constantly doing things. Now, uh, that mankind uh, just uh, cannot leave anything alone. He has to improve everything, change it, come up with a new model, whether we're talking about the natural world or, in fact, all the gadgets and, and mechanisms that man produces, we're always going for more, more, more. And this is what we have to change, this attitude of more all the time. And a minimalist, the min what a minimalist is actually achieving is that they're actually going the opposite direction. Instead of more, more, more all the time, 
it's less, less, less all the time. And you, you know that your feeling of comp accomplishment and joy uh, at living a good life and yet using as few of the world's resources as possible, which means you, they're still there for other people to use stuff. Um, that's what we have to do. We all have to use less, and if we all use less, then that will have a huge effect on the destruction we're doing on the planet. But I do understand that if everybody <laughs> lived like I do, in other words, buying as little as possible, making as much of, um, my making as many things as possible myself, doing without almost everything. I do have a car. It's a, a smart car. It's the smallest car I could find, of course. And it moved me from BC to Cape Breton in a week. And it cost me $400 in fuel. And amazingly, I had all my possessions in my smart car when I drove here. So that was a, a, a real demonstration of m minimalism. But we have to change this attitude of we want more, more, more all the time. We have to get into a different headspace where it's less, less, less all the time. And it has to be understood that when we're getting by with less, we're helping the planet. There's no doubt about it. Everything, every time you spend money, you are using the world's resources. That is, uh, you, you know, you, you really can't get around that. And uh, that's okay if you're buying things you need, but uh, I'm sure 98% of what we manufacture and buy is unnecessary, and a lot of it is, uh, is rubbish. Uh, it may not be rubbish when it comes out of the factory, although that's a matter of opinion, of course. Um, but within uh, two or three years, it definitely will be rubbish, and it'll be thrown away. And that's the uh, that, and the, uh, the, econ the manufacturers have to do that. I mean, if they made things like they did in the 20s and 30s that would last for 40 or 50 years, then their markets would very soon become saturated, and they wouldn't be able to sell anything. So, and and. That, that is a problem with minimalism. Like if everybody lived like I do, uh, uh, half the factories, maybe more than half the factories producing this stuff that I think is uh, unnecessary, half the factories in the world would shut down, which means an enormous number of people would be without work. And that's a huge problem because of the system we have. Everybody has to work. But that's the thing. We have to change the system. And the, the way the individual can change the system is just by opting out of the system. Get outside the box. This is a box. The system is a box. And, we're, and they make sure we're in it, well and truly in it, when we leave college. Which is why they make sure that all the students have got huge debts when they leave college, because then they got them. They got them. These guys, these people leaving college are supposed to be the high earners and make plenty of money so they'll be able to pay the loan off. And uh, those are the kind of people that the banks and, everybody and the monetary system, the financial industry, wants those students to be in debt when they leave college and they want to keep them in debt until the day they die. And that is how the system works. I have no debts. Uh, and I'm free. When I was owing payments, which I have for some part times of my life, I've paid mortgage payments and, and uh, various other payments, uh, car payments and things like that, and I didn't feel free, but now I feel really free. And so minimalism gives one a sense of freedom because uh, these, uh, these debts, <laughs> these the economic system, the bankers and and the tax people haven't got their fingers in you because you don't owe them any money. And I don't actually pay, I pay less taxes than many CEOs <laughs> of big companies because uh, I make so little that I actually am below the tax limit. But I, t I, I do acknowledge various things. Um, I'm single. Uh, I got, I had a wonderful wife up until a 
about three years ago, and, and she's still in Edmonton. She's a yoga teacher, and she's staying in Edmonton, and I couldn't stay in Edmonton. Once I retired, I had to leave and go and live in the country on the edge of the forest, and this is what I've always wanted to do, and I'm doing it in wonderful Cape Breton. And I'm very glad I'm here, and it's beautiful. And I just want to encourage the people here to make the best use of what they have. And what they have here is a fantastic. Cape Breton is gorgeous. I just love it. The, the, the people here are great. They're working people. They work for a living. They don't s there, there's not a lot of white collar <laughs> workers here, which suits me fine. I've got more friends since I came to um, Ile Madame than uh, any place I've ever lived. It's, it's wonderful. And if we can, I, I can see Cape Breton being a leadership place in Canada. Because although Cape Breton is often thought of as, as a backwater and that the good times have left, the good times being the, the coal mines and the steel industry and all that, uh, not really good times as far as people like me are concerned. Uh, of course, because as you can see, I'm very much an environmentalist and the, the industrial mess left in Sydney is uh, not good. But that was that was when the big that was when the money left. There are people making good money now, uh, fishing lobsters. Uh, a few years ago, the lobsters they weren't making any money. <laughs> so that's uh, that's uh, the fi the fishing industry is like farming. It's you can have several good years and then you can have a couple of bad years that knocks you right down again. But uh, generally speaking, Cape Breton is not uh, an engine of uh, economic uh, prosperity. Uh, in relation to the rest of Canada. And actually, I think this gives us an opportunity. I think it gives us an opportunity to develop minimalist structures and a minimalist, minimalist <laughs> ethic. Uh, and that's really the way the world has to go. And so Cape Breton could actually lead in this. And we've got some wonderful things going on here. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of organic farming going on in places where there, which is suitable still for farming. A lot of the agricultural land has gone back to forest, as you well know, because uh, the population now is much lower than it used to be. A third of Cape Breton's population has left in the last 20, 20, 25 years or so. And so Cape Breton is actually a great place for minimalists. And many of the people living here are natural minimalists. They don't need anybody like me to come along and tell them. It's the way they've always lived. They've lived off the land, basically, or off the sea in most cases, in, uh, in Nova Scotia. And they've made do with what they can get. And some of them have done very well, but most of them are just ticking along. And that's the way we should be doing. We shouldn't be accumulating huge bank accounts it doesn't make you a successful man, a successful woman, to, be, to have a lot of money in the bank. What makes you a successful man and a woman is what you do for the planet. And that generally translates as what you do for the community. Because the answer to the many of the problems facing us, which are caused by huge corporations, multinational corporations, transnational corporations, that have no investment in the country or the locality or the region in which they're operating, and they don't give a damn. They just trash it for profit. That is one of the problems. These giant corporations have no investment other than financial in the regions in which they um, mine or utilize the resources that are there, in, in the case of Cape Breton, it's trees. And we have to stop building and using resources beyond their capability to replace themselves. I mean, it's common sense. I mean, you know, I, I figured this out when I was 14, and I'm, 
I'm not a rocket scientist. In fact, I've worked most of my life in construction, banging nails and cutting pieces of wood and that kind of thing, which is how I like to work. I like to work with my hands. But the people running the show nowadays are not invested in communities. They, they have no idea how local communities can provide a meaningful lifestyle for people without having to have a super high paying job, or hopefully without both parents having to work. How nice it would be if both parents didn't have to work all the time. When I was a nipper, when I was a young lad, I was told that when I was uh, grown up, that uh, when I was 40 or 50, you know, and people wouldn't have to work very much. We'd have machines to do the work. And we'd work three or four days a week, and at the most, and then more or less by choice. And, you know, now, now that I'm well past 40, and I look around and I'm thinking like, well, what happened? You know, everybody's working harder than ever before. Uh, their standard of living has stayed rem the same or dropped in the last 10, 15 years. It's not working. It is working for the few who are at the top and that's the way investment works. If you get enough money to invest and you make a couple of good investments, hey, you're making money for doing nothing. The bankers and all those people, they say, oh yeah, the banks made so many billions. Nonsense. They didn't make a damn thing. They just manipulated the system so that a whole pile of other people's money ended up in their business. And I know that's the way it's always done, but we have to make huge changes in the way we do things. And minimalism is at the forefront. Like. If we can all use less each year, then we will get society, it'll st we'll start turning the ship around. But it's a big ship, it's been going a long time in the same direction. It's a huge ship, and it takes a long time to turn it around. But as, I as individuals, we c that's what we have to do. If we don't act as individuals, how can we expect society to change? Society is not an individual, it's a system. It's a system that's been built by uh, I individuals that were talented, but not infallible. And uh, our system of more, 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 uh, basically capitalism and investment, um, has worked very well. But its time has come when it's, time to change, and that's very difficult. And you'll find out how difficult it is when you try to change. Like, I, I hesitate to say this, because I know <laughs> as some of you <laughs> might want to turn off the TV, but uh, I hope not. Uh, but the fact is, I've been a vegetarian since I was four, with a few notable g gaps when I would eat chickens fingers and things like that, because uh, it, when I was a teenager, you couldn't get vegetarian <laughs> food in, in restaurants. But um, being a vegetarian is probably the biggest and easiest step you can take to being a minimalist as regards the Earth's resources. Unfortunately, our farming in the last 50 years, 70 years maybe, has deteriorated from what it used to be, where it was farming, uh, mixed farms, mix, uh, family farms, relatively small farms, making up rural communities. Well, now the farms are huge, mega industrial monocultures, and because they're so huge and they're monocultures, they require pesticides use and Oh, it's just a mess. I, w I won't eat it. In which case, you know, you, I know you might be thinking, well, you know, like, wait a minute, he doesn't eat meat. 
probably doesn't eat fish, and he won't eat half the stuff grown in the fields because they put Roundup on it. What does he eat? Well, this is the trick. I eat sprouts. I eat nice brown bread and rice and potatoes and things like that. It's all food. And Did you know that two weeks before they harvest canola and wheat, two weeks before they harvest it and it goes, is sold and shipped for processing, two weeks they spray their crop with Roundup. Yes, Roundup. That solution that has the triangles on the bottle saying, danger, danger, you know. Well, two weeks before they harvest canola and wheat, our industrial farmers, and they probably don't have any option in this because of the economic situation of the system, our wonderful farmers spray all the canola and all the wheat with Roundup, two weeks before it's harvested. And the reason they do this is to save money and it, because it, because it kills the plant. That's what Roundup does. It kills, uh, it kills broadleaf plants, and uh, that's that goes on our food. And the re it kills the it kills the canola, it kills the wheat, and that allows the grain and the canola to dry partially dry in the fields before they bring it in and artificially dry it. And so it saves them a lot of heat, a lot of energy that they would use in the artificial drying process by drying it in the food field. But it does mean that all our food is sprayed with Roundup two weeks before it's harvested. And that is unbelievable. I mean, I, I won't eat it if I can avoid it. And how do I avoid it? Cheaply, I eat sprouts. Now, sprouts, we all know what sprouts are. They're, you know, bean sprouts and things. You've eaten them in Chinese restaurants and you've seen them in the supermarkets and that kind of thing. But you can sprout any seeds. And if you're sprouting seeds that are nu nutritious, um, seeds are packed. The seeds are a miracle. They're packed full of enzymes and, and all kinds of interesting chemicals that form the basis of life. And you, all you have to do is add water and out comes the plant. Well, in a lot of, for a lot of vegetables, a lot of vegetables and other plants too, the most nutritious period of their life is the 10 days after they sprouted, when the little plant grows up out of the seed and it grows up about that tall. And that's what I do. I buy kilogram bags of alfalfa or broccoli. Uh, actually, I've got about 10 different packets of some mixed seeds and stuff. Uh, I buy them online. Um, they're just, you just have to go online and uh, there's a wonderful Canadian family and family farm in Saskatchewan that will send you any organic seeds out of a catalog of about 46, 47 different seeds that they produce and uh, package. And uh, so, and that, I, I buy a 25 pound bag of alfalfa seeds and a 25 pound bag of broccoli seeds. If men eat broccoli every week, they stand them. It, is, it helps them a great deal in combating the onset of prostate cancer. But anyway, so I, for 50 bucks, those two bags of seeds will give me beautiful, healthy food for over a year. It's really cheap. And so one of my main um, sources of nutrients is I eat sprout sandwiches, good bread, um, almond butter, and a pile of sprouts. And it's delicious. And that's, that's where I get most of my vegetables from. Now that's a minimalist diet. It's very cheap, very healthy. And uh, I love it. It's tasty, it's delicious. Uh, my son's coming out to visit me in about three weeks. And uh, I'm, I'd be interested to see what what he thinks about my lifestyle. I mean, he knows I'm outside the box anyway, because I always have been. And incidentally, my mother was outside the box, so that's possibly why I'm outside the box. And my father was in the Navy, and he was never around, so, you know, he used to come home, and uh, my mother and was talking <laughs> about Buddhism and Hinduism and, and yoga and things, and uh, I, f I feel for my father. He was... Uh, I think uh, 
his wife and, and me went off <laughs> in a different direction from the Royal Navy. But that's okay. And uh, so I, I was lucky. I'm basically, I, was ra I received three years Buddhist teachings from my mother from the age of 10 to 13. I didn't realize I was receiving Buddhist teachings. Uh, as far as I was concerned, she was just reading me stories and uh, adventures of pilgrims and people like that in, in India and in the Himalayas. Um, but it took hold, and I am basically, I decided when I was 14, I was going to live uh, the li my life as a Buddhist, which incidentally also means I live my life as a Christian, because the teachings of Jesus and Buddha are identical. And that's because they're both talking about spiritual truths. And if you understand spiritual truths, if you are a keen follower of, of any of the great prophets, and especially Buddha and Jesus, you will not damage the planet. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, I, I see people who call themselves Christians, and et cetera, and yet they seem to have no concept of, of this magnificent planet. I, I'm awful. I'm literally an awful man. I'm full of awe. That's what the word originally meant. Somehow or other it got turned round. But yeah, I'm an awful man, and I'm going to stay that way. And. Uh, I, I cannot understand how people can treat the world the way they do. And that's what minimalism is all about. It's all about leaving a smaller footprint on the planet as you can. And it doesn't mean to say you have to have a restricted or confined lifestyle. In fact, quite the reverse. It gives you freedom and stress-free. I'm not young. I'm 74. I'm a long-distance cyclist. I, I'm in pretty good shape. I've got no aches and pains or anything like that. I'm not taking any medica medications, and I'm not going to if I can avoid it. I've had cancer for 35 years. Um, it's completely uh, non-symptomatic. <laughs> and uh, it's largely because of my lifestyle. and. My lifestyle is that of a minimalist. And uh, I uh, would like to see more minimalism. Don't buy new stuff if you don't need it. Don't buy a new cell phone just because the phone company tells you you need it. If you don't need it, you don't need it. Don't buy things you don't need. Grow as much of your food as you can. and. Uh, you don't have to live in the country and have a big garden to grow your own food. I became really interested in my diet when I got cancer. And um, I quit eating sugar. Actually, I quit eating sugar before I got cancer. Now that, that is a very important thing. It's uh, a minimalist <laughs> will not eat sugar. Sugar is one of the most dangerous things that mankind uses, makes use of on a daily basis. Sugar kills and injures far more people than tobacco, uh, tobacco ever did. You know, if we were living naturally, we wouldn't be eating piles. 110 pounds of fake fructose gets eaten every year by the average North American, 110 pounds. Now, if we were living as hunter-gatherers, we would get fructose from fruit. We would not eat it continually all the time. It would be real fructose. And from what I understand, the different types of sugars, the glucoses, the sucroses, and, and the fructoses, etc. The liver does different things with them. And from what I understand, from what I've researched, is that fructose, the liver turns fructose to fat. That's what it does. And that's because when we were hunter-gatherers, we would 
camp under a tree that was full of ripe fruit and we would binge on it until we finished all the fruit in three or four days. And we'd have absorbed way more energy in the form of fructose from the fruit than we could possibly burn at, in those three or four days. So our liver stores it as fat. And that's what happens to fructose. Well, our food is, 40% of our food has fructose in it. And it's not natural fructose, it's synthetic fructose made from corn syrup using a process that involves using chemicals such as hydrochloric acid, etc. And uh, consequently, you know, and so everybody's eating piles of the wrong kind of sugar. They're not getting enough exercise. Kids have stopped doing gym at school and they're all overweight and got diabetes. I just can't figure it out. Oh my God, what's going on? Well, I'm telling you, it's because we're stupid. Human beings are the only animal that is smart enough to be stupid. You know, apes, you know, uh, chimpanzees and stuff, they do stupid things, but they don't do massively stupid things. We do massively stupid things. Like filling the oceans with plastic. <laughs> and fracking through aquifers and releasing huge amounts of methane. And that. We are, we are human beings are stupid. We've got to start being sensible and we've got to stop being drugged and hoodwinked by our insatiable search for money. We've all heard the saying, money is the root of all evil. That is not actually the saying. The saying is, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is just money. It's just a means of exchange. The love of money is what the problem is. And people are totally addicted to money. The poor all want money because they need money. And that's legitimate. But why these people who've got, you know, several million in the bank, why they can't stop themselves going for more and more and more, uh, it, it shows weakness of character, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, these rich people who, in their fancy cars and highfalutin attitudes, as far as I'm concerned, they're not successful people. Not successful at all. They're actually uh, portraying their willful ignorance about how life works and the forces of nature um, dictate how we live. And man has got this arrogant idea that he knows better than nature and that he's going to improve the situation when, uh, no, he's not. So um, what we all need to do is use less, think more, and follow our intuition. Things become achieved. Um, hu humanity manages to achieve things by desire. Uh, there's a little spark, first of all, uh, which is a we see something and we the little spark of desire. Or we can improve that, or I could do that better, or, oh, that's a good idea, you know, a little spark, a little desire. And then and we that gives us a feeling. It's emotional. We 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 have a feeling of like, oh, I feel that that would be good. You know, I feel feel positive towards that. I feel that would be a good thing. And then we start use. Then we bring in the mental faculties, and we start thinking about how to achieve what we have a feeling for. We start using our logic and our reason and hopefully, maybe, possibly getting advice from somebody else. But we use our mental faculties. And then finally, when we've figured it out enough, we actually take action. Either we either make something or we do something or anything like that. So it starts off with emotions. It goes through the mental into the physical, which is where we actually produce the, uh, the item or the effect that we're trying to produce. And uh, I'm, I'm hinting at the edges of Buddhism here, but it's also the same thing that Jesus talked about. Our soul, our cosmic consciousness, is what we are. What, what are we? We are spiritual beings experiencing 
the material plane in a human body, in a human personality. And what we should be doing is controlling our personality, not other people. I'm a control freak. And that would surprise people who know me because uh, I've got a reputation for being um, spontaneous, not making any plans, just letting things roll and stuff. And, uh, but I know in actual fact, I'm a control freak and I'm controlling myself. I'm not here to control anybody else. I have no right to control anybody else unless they're doing something that is either going to cause damage to them or damage to others and or the planet. Um, when I say I don't want anybody doing damage to others, I'm referring to animals as well as human beings. I'm referring to planets, to plants as well as human beings. I'm referring to everything in the planet. We have to be more responsible and we have to cut down on our use of almost everything. I, I was talking to somebody in the co-op just uh, a few minutes ago, and I told them I was going to do a little talk on minimalism. And uh, they said, oh, minimalism is all right, except when it comes to toilet paper, eh? Ha, ha, ha. And uh, I said, ah, no, no, I got you there. I said, for 40 bucks, you can get a a plastic bidet fitment that anybody can fit on their toilet, and you know, the standard toilet in 10 minutes, and then you'll have a bidet on your toilet, and you will use hardly any toilet paper, and you'll be the cleanest person in the room, and you'll be saving a lot of trees. And just go online and Google toilet bidet attachment, and you'll see a whole bunch. And, uh, I had one on my house, um, in my uh, condo in Edmonton, and uh, I tell you, it wakes you up pretty good. So, <laughs> so if you do nothing else, get a, a retrofit toilet bidet attachment, and you will be saving many hundreds of trees throughout the rest of your life. So uh, that's probably enough for now. Um, I sometimes, as you may notice, I sometimes find it a little difficult to stay <laughs> on the subject. But basically, minimalism is the way to go for the individual. If, if you feel you can't do anything to help the planet as an individual, if you feel powerless to do anything, just do it for yourself. Do it for the planet. You'll feel good and be, become a minimalist. And you'll find you'll have lots of money because you're not spending it. Don't buy anything, anything, until you, unless you have a real need for it. Otherwise, you're just supporting the destruction of the planet. So my message to everybody is to try and use less all the time in everything you do. It doesn't mean to say you lead a, fun, a life devoid of fun or having fun, quite the reverse. You've actually got more time to have fun. And uh, you also uh, have the satisfaction of knowing you're not wrecking the planet and uh, destroying the opportunities that your children and grandchildren should have. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my first talk on being outside the box. And I recommend minimalism for everybody. It's a growing trend. You didn't hear anything, anything about it two or three years ago. Now it's, now it's being mentioned quite a lot. And uh, I'm the founding member and president of the Institute of Applied Minimology. And uh, I'm where I live is actually the East Coast headquarters of the Institute of Applied Minimology. Um, I think I should say at this time that I'm the only member of the Institute because, after all, we are applying minimology <laughs> to, the <laughs> to the operation. So it's all good fun, and that's what it's all about. So thank you very much for watching, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again outside the box.